All right, today is October 31st, 2021. This is week five of the Lost Confederacy. Uh, when most people hear the word Confederacy, the first thing they think about is redneck or ignorant European. And uh, one of the reasons, or part of the reason this channel is dedicated to uh, uplifting real American history, Confederacy is actually an American form of government. Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna introduce the other chiefs on this channel. Uh, we're gonna introduce Chief Quiet Water, Chief Black Coat, and myself, Chief Alligator. And so we're gonna go ahead and jump right back into the Treaty of Port Gibson, 1833. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, kick off the uh, couple of articles that we always build on before we get into the readings for tonight. So Chief Quiet Water, do you wanna go ahead and uh, share your screen? Okay, so the first article that we are going to look at is the first paragraph in Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. And we can see that it says, no state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. And so what we always want to beat home in the beginning of all of our videos is the fact that there is no money. Uh, what we call money today is actually fiat currency. Uh, fiat currency is a currency that isn't backed by gold. Uh, the world reserve currency, which is known as the dollar bill, has not been backed by gold since 1971. Uh, Richard Nixon and Congress came up with the Gold Standard Act. So for all my adult, for all my life, uh, anytime that I have worked, I have never been paid money. And so that's one of the first things we have to start recovering from as prisoners of war. Uh, this channel is dedicated to bringing to the enlightenment of our people that you are prisoners of war. Uh, I'm speaking strictly to the American as reclassified or has been reclassified as Negro, colored, black, Afro-American, and now people of color. If your mother and father were born on this land and your grandparents were born on this land and your great grandparents were born on this land, I'm talking to that specific group of people, the American, you would be nationalized. And what we're doing one week at a time, one sentence at a time, one article in a treaty at a time is we're providing proof of claim to the world that we are prisoners of war. Y'all want to build on this section of Article One about the fact that there is no money. And the only thing that you can outright give a state to own anything in a state is gold or silver payment. I think you explained it pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. right there in black and white. Yeah, the people are exactly what was needed. <laughs> in the Constitution, so. <laughs> okay, we'll jump to the next article, which will be Article 2, Section 2. And we'll uh, just read half of this first paragraph. The president shall be commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. And so again, we're proving that we're prisoners of war. Uh, we would have not launched out on this project had January 6, 2021 not took place or had all the riots and uprising in 2020 not taken place. So when you saw whatever they want to call these militia groups, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, when you saw them show up in January 6th with AR-15s and a hanging station built in front of the Capitol, and they were shitting and pissing on the floors in the Capitol, and you had public servants hiding in chambers not to be killed or hung, when you saw them bum rush the uh, transfer of power when they were counting the electoral votes, that was an attempted coup d'etat. It was not an insurrection. The reason why I'm bringing this section up is because the militia can only come out when the president calls him. Period, point blank in the discussion. Um, Y'all want to build on that? Right. Um, yeah, this, the um, interest was sparked from definitely last year when everything took place in regards to the um, rioting and the protesting and all of those things. But um, January 6th definitely highlighted the fact that it's just open season for um, 
certain people to be able to do what they want to do. And, and that's what was done and nothing up to date has been done about it. So that definitely brings it home in section two. Yeah, I agree with Chief Alligator and Chief Quietwater. Uh, yeah, January 6th was an eye-opening day to see that happen and then to understand everything that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis to Black Americans still mind-boggling and still trying to connect the dots on how that can happen but a lot of these <coughs> excuse me a lot of these cop killings are just kind of going under the table so you know seeing what's going on seeing this government pretty much collapse right in front of us it's pretty amazing <coughs> okay all right so in the last one we'll do is uh article six second paragraph where it says this constitution and the laws of the united states which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the united states shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding and so here again uh being born into a group that was denationalized after the Civil War, uh, brought up under United States government under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, reclassified as Negro, Black, colored, Afro-American, and now an attempt for people of color. Uh, show me a group of people that have four or five generations buried in the soil that they live on and you do not know what happened on that land, that's a nigga. You go anywhere on planet earth and you talk to the people of the land, they can tell you the history of it. So why are we reading treaties? Because it's the supreme law of the land. It's the ground floor of what happened in America. And I just think it's very interesting that nobody reads treaties. And so what happens is we're, a, it's like we're in la la land. It's like we're in a fifth dimensional reality where we know nothing about what happened on the land. So that's the reason why we're reading treaties. You wanna know what happened in the Creek Confederacy, which can, which comprises of everything from the Carolinas all the way over to Louisiana, which is where the Mississippi River runs from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada. You wanna know what happened in the area where your family originates from? You need to read the treaties and find out what happened in that area. What wars, who conquered that area? What were the name of the people in that area? That's that's the name of your your, your great grandparents or your great 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 grandparents. Y'all want to build on that? Yeah, and I just think that um, reading these treaties have definitely opened my eyes up because, of course, we weren't taught this in school. And I just think that if this is taught at the the real history is taught at a very young age. Um, the perception of who we are, who we were, and, you know, continuing who we are would stand out in people's mind from a very young age and, you know, um, have the spirit of not being defeated and not bowing down and things of that nature. Um, so I just think, yeah, the, the treaties being the supreme law of the land, I understand because it was the blueprint of how things came about, basically. Yeah, I agree. Uh... I think this is the biggest secret out there and reading these treaties pretty much put everything into perspective. Everything comes full circle. The big secret, you know, within our people and within our group is you are the American and, you know, us doing our homework, reading these treaties word for word, sentence for sentence, you know, gives us that confidence of who we are. Then we move forward and know how to move within the world of being a prisoner of war going back to everything else going on today in this world. So yeah, um, reading these treaties is. Enlightening, enlightening for sure. Tells the truth of America. Mm -hmm. And if I can just throw one more thing on before we move right into the 1833 Fort Gibson Treaty, mm -hmm. uh, we have to understand as prisoners of war, before you click off Chief Quiet Water, we were not a part of the United States government until after the Civil War. A lot of times when you hear people who have our lineage talk about American history, 
they act as if we were a part of the union. No, we did not become a part of the United States government until after the Civil War and they made amendments after being murdered for trying to take our ancestors land. They created the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment. So I wanna re-emphasize that because when you look at American history, you have to put yourself on the right side of the chessboard. You are the American. The European established their government on July 4th, 1776. You had nothing to do with that government until 1865. After the Civil War is when they created the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment and then the 1866 Civil Rights Act specifically for our lineage. But because we don't know this, we have nothing to refer back to to make the European honor and to honor our ancestors which fought and murdered people in order to become a part of this government because our Confederacy and our nations had dissolved because they were pushing us west of the Mississippi. I'll stop right there. Let's get straight into the Fort Gibson 1833 treaty and let's finish this bill. And you guys see it good? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I can start it. Okay. Okay, so Article 4, it is hereby mutually understood and agreed between the parties of, to this treaty that the land assigned to the Muskegee Indians, I'm sorry, that the land assigned to the Muskegee Indians by second article thereof shall be taken and considered the property of the whole Muskegee or Creek Nation. So basically they're, um, the land that was signed to the Muskegee is basically being spread thin, um, right? To combine the Creek and the Muskegee Nation. And so um, it's being spread to um, very thin to include, encompass all of them. Um, as well- If you could just add that next little part. As well of those now residing upon the land as the great body of said nation who still remain on the east side of the Mississippi. Okay. Right. So I can see a conflict okay. coming. I can see a conflict coming right. because you're combining the Muskegee and the Creek and the people that were already on the land. Right, right. So you already have a nation there. Right. And so it's going to incite a lot of infighting and disagreements and things like that. Right. Okay. And I think we read this last, well, yeah, we read this last week because that last sentence you read as the great body of said nation. Oh, I did. Still, yeah. Still remained on the east side of the Mississippi. So again, for everybody who wants to believe that everybody went into Oklahoma on the trail of tears, that's a bold faced lie. That's why we're reading the Supreme Law of the Land. The great body, the majority of us did not leave. And you're looking at the descendants of those people that did not leave. We're the ones that caught hell through convict leasing, through Jim Crow, through segregation, through mass incarceration, through the war on poverty, through the war on drugs, not the invisible war to coronavirus, where they're giving money and protection to Asians and gays and illegal citizens now are supposed to get half a million dollar checks individually. Why are you always ignored is the question that I'm asking all your so-called scholars. If we're not prisoners of war, why are we ignored? Y'all want to build on that? Just to iterate right. to your question, <clears throat> if you're not prisoners of war, then what is it? The American, you know, this body of land belonging to us, European, occupying it. So give everybody else resources, starve them out, you know, see how much more, how many more cold winters can they endure? Um, it's kind of in our faces now. Right. And, it's embarrassing at some point because it's like, okay, citizens under this government is like that. <clears throat> no resources at all, just a, a party, June 19th. Do they think we're that under, like, <clears throat> sometimes I'm just like, okay, some, the math ain't mathing for real, for real now. Yeah, and it's like the, they're, you know, this whole minority thing is just other other mm -hmm. groups of people that are just on top of us, on top of us, pressing us down definitely to the last class in society, mm -hmm. um, the lower class in society. And um, 
we have to see it for ourselves. And actually, this is just highlighting everything in regards to what we're actually going through now. All right. All right. Reading these treaties, highlighting exactly what mm-hmm. we've always been going through. Exactly. It never ended. Okay. Um, And it is also understood and agreed that the Seminole Indians of Florida, whose removal to this country is provided by their treaty with the U.S. dated May 9th, 1832. So we actually did read this last week, but um, basically they did specify that it was, you know, to be clear, it's the treaty with the U.S. because prior to it, it wasn't. So they treated with the militia. Exactly. They definitely made that clear in in this section of um, the article. Shall also have a permanent and comfortable home on the lands hereby set apart as the country of the Creek Nation. And they, the Seminoles, will hereafter be considered a constituent part of said nation, but are to be relocated on some part of the Creek country by themselves. So is that basically saying that the Seminoles will have a small portion on that on that piece of land? Is that mm-hmm. what that's saying? No, what they're doing is they're putting the Seminole Nation up under the Creek Nation. Okay. It says we'll hereafter be considered a constituent part of part. Seminole Nation. Okay, got but, you. But are to be located on some part of the Creek country by themselves. So yeah, they're going to put them in Creek jurisdiction but say, oh, you got your own thing. No, I really don't, because I'm up on I'm on Creek land. You're not you're not on Creek land, but based on the gun and what the European military is saying, yeah, here's the Creek area. You figure out where you want to go on their area. That's basically what wow. that, that's working. Okay. Okay. Um that code, which you build on that? Uh no, I think you said it. I think you said it. Yeah, you know. Clearly, the similar on the creek were nearby and, um, <clears throat> as far as land masses. So now it's looking like, okay, one, they have no respect for the similar. That's obvious throughout reading these treaties. Creeks big enough with land mass, whatever, you know, making them dependent up under the creek, no longer giving them their own say so, pretty much making them uh, citizens of the creek nation now uh, in their way. So now they're no longer their own. Uh, confederate nation or anything like that <clears throat> right, we're going to finish that last little piece off chief quiet water okay um which location will be selected for them by the commissioners who have signed these articles of agreement or convention right okay so it's up yeah. to commissioners to tell the seminoles where they're going to go where to go in, in creek territory i'll do the next one article five if you want to highlight it all right. Uh, as an evidence of the kind feeling of the United States towards the Muscogee Americans, and as a testimonial of their gratification with the present amicable and satisfactory adjustment of their difficulties with the Cherokees experienced by the commissioners, they agree on behalf of the United States to furnish to the Creek Americans west of the Mississippi one blacksmith and one real right or wagon maker. Okay, so if we go back up real quick. <clears throat> so we can see right here, based on what they're saying, is the Muscogee American and the Cherokees were bumping heads, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it says, and as a testimonial of their gratification with the present amicable and satisfactory adjustment of their difficulties with the Cherokees, So Muskegee and Cherokee didn't get along, uh, experienced by the commissioners. They agree on behalf of the United States to furnish the Creek Americans west of the Mississippi, one blacksmith and one real right or wagon maker. So what I'm taking from that, here's another note in American history, the Cherokee and the Muskegee nations, those were the wagon making builders. Mm. And so what they told the United States is, okay, we'll send some of our skilled men west of the Mississippi and we'll go teach the Creek how to make wagons. Mm. That's what, that's what I'm taking from that. What y'all, what y'all want to build on that? 
Yeah, that makes then, sense. Yeah, it sounded like there was a contract being made between two parties, and uh, a resource within that contract was a little right or a wedding maker. So, you know. Mm-hmm. Right, and a blacksmith. I don't, I don't want to forget the blacksmith. So here we blacksmith go. Blacksmith as well. We can see that the American was the skilled person, which we know that because we've created all we invented so much right so so there are so all the all, all the european really was doing was just strong arm and everything and so they mm-hmm. were basically like all right what you need out there west of the mississippi right they mm-hmm. were basically just delegating they couldn't do anything but they knew that they had skilled people a skilled group of people and so they just had to delegate to get things done and get exactly what they wanted as soon as they may be required by the nation, in addition to those already employed, also to erect shop, erect shops and furnish tools for the same. So yeah, these were the tradesmen. The Cherokee and Tuskegee, they had the skills east of the Mississippi River. And so basically the European is saying, hey, we're giving all authority to the Creek Nation west of the Mississippi right? Because the Creek Nation is the one that contracted directly with the United States government. So they're saying, hey, these Creeks, they're not real builders like that. But these nations of people have the skills people. So you need to send some of those people over here to help these Creeks, which wow. I build on that. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty clear. That's exactly what they did. So now we can see when we talk about towns in the Creek Confederacy or what you call the Bible Belt or the Dirty South, mm-hmm. it's telling you right here, we were the wagon makers, we were the blacksmith, we erected shops and furnished tools. We already was doing that. It's telling us right here. And it says nothing about we had to teach them how to do these things or, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or anything of that sort. Is They used them for the skills. They did not know how to do any of that. All right, and supply the Smith shops with one ton of iron and 250 pounds of steel each and allow the said Creek Americans annual for education purposes, the sum of $1,000. So basically we finna set up shop west of the Mississippi River. You're gonna send the Muscogee and the Creek out there. They come in with iron, they come in with steel, they come in with, they finna erect shops, they finna furnish tools, they finna bring their blacksmith, they finna bring their wagon makers. We getting ready to build west of the Mississippi, like we already had it cracking. East right, of Mississippi. exactly. <laughs> Come on, y'all. <laughs> wow, that's horrible. Anybody else want to build on that? I mean, that's exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. We had everything on lock. We were established. Really? We had our nation, and um. They basically just use them. They use them for their own good to to do exactly what they needed and and um, fulfill their goal. Yeah, there's a lot of skilled workers and chiefs or whoever, whatever their jobs were. You know, you can just see them being moved all around. You know, who's valuable, putting them somewhere in there so that that nation or that reservation camp or whatever it is can flourish with their skilled workers. So you can just see what the Europeans doing. You know, seeing who knows what what skills are what, and using those bodies, trafficking, you know, mm-hmm. pushing them places, helping their communities grow, whatever whatever they had back then. Because of course, the Europeans are living within these quarters; they need these workers for some right. reason. So yeah. So let me go. Let me let me go a little deeper on what you just said. So realistically, okay, so you got them roped off by meets and bounds, mm-hmm. right? That's your military. Right. And so is it to say that you may have like a recon team that are watching these people on a day to day like, OK, mm. they're accounting. OK, those group over there, they build the wagons. Exactly. Oh, that group over there are the mm. blacksmith. They're accounting for who in these nations, in these wow, accounting. Right. They're accounting for who does what. Mm-hmm. And, they're basically, and they're basically saying, send these people west of the Mississippi. Mm. You feel me? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing they do now, just like with the essential and non-essential. Mm-hmm. You know, when Trump closed the government down on March 16th, 2020, right? When he closed the borders, 
that's a form of bankruptcy because essential and non-essential is like a balance sheet. Who's your assets? Who's your liabilities? Your liabilities are things you're willing to walk away from. So the United States government said, we're willing to walk away from everybody who doesn't have a skill. Literally. It's the same thing would happen here. Who do we need out of these nations of people now that we're military occupying them? Well, we need the people who know how to build shit. Everybody else stay home and sit in front of the TV. That's why I never stopped. That's why Chief Quietwater never stopped and Chief Blackcoat never stopped last year. We don't know nothing about a shutdown because we have a tangible skill set that we provide. We have, we're, we're service providers and, and prisoners of war need to understand that moving forward. We're living in a time where you better learn how to do something that is essential. The United States government is walking away from all liabilities, i.e. unskilled. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Chief Black Coach, Chief Quiet War. Can't pay for it no more. Can't afford non-essential businesses or non-essential skills. Right. And you're seeing exactly. it here playing out. Mm -hmm. Western exactly. Mississippi continue to help them folks over there. We're giving them something because we're doing contracts with them. Right. And everybody else. And they yeah. needed them. They mm -hmm. needed them. They were essential. They, needed. Needed, they had the skills. And so they did need them for the things mm -hmm. that would afford them whatever life that they were pursuing. So yeah, you're right. And this played out last year because of all of this, um, the shutdowns with COVID and everything. So that was a real eye it was an eye opener, right? Exactly. For them to even put it in documentation saying essential businesses, giving it mm -hmm. up to the business owners, letting them know who can and who can't operate. Operate, right. And so it's like, oh wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do here in a consumer, you know, uh, business or a consumer uh, nation. So this is what we do here in order to right. bail ourselves out, sit everybody down that ain't making no money. Exactly. Or providing a service. Mm -hmm. So it says the sum of $1,000 to be expended under the direction of the president of the United States. The whole of the above grants to be continued so long as the president may consider them conducive to the interests and welfare of the Creek Americans. So basically, you're sending skilled people from other nations to help build up the Creek Nation west of the Mississippi. And it's all conducive on the president of the United States. So basically, the president of the United States is going to sit back and he's going to monitor the, 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 the shops they erect. Uh, the blacksmithing that they're doing, the wagons that they're making, what they're doing right. with the steel, what they're doing with the iron. And as long as he sees progress and he sees this Creek Nation building up, he'll continue to issue grants. A grant ain't nothing but just a complete front of resources to a business owner that you don't have to worry about paying back. It's a hustler's dream. It's like, give, dropping, the, it's like dropping the product in front of me and saying, go do what you want to do with it. Check. <clears throat> Y'all mm -hmm. feel that? <clears throat> Well, yeah, you know they're going to front the money because it's going to make it back. So, like you said, they're seeing what these Cherokees or these certain skilled blacksmithmen from these nations can do. So, yeah, they're going to keep pushing out. That's building up now their empire, the United States, because now I got all these workers. So it's just, like you said, grant that money for They're like, oh, wow, this is what they can do. Let's throw a little silver here, a little gold here, or fiat, whatever they was doing. All right. Probably fiat getting that system going. <clears throat> it says, and the United States. No, hold on, let me go back. Yes. And the United States will also cause to be erected as soon as conveniently can be done for patent railway mills for grinding corn and would immediately purchase for them 24 crosscut saws. So here we go. As soon as they send their military out there, their military is going to survey the land. Okay, where we're going to put these nations that we're going to move west of the Mississippi. They put them out there and they realize, damn, they don't grow what they grow east of the Mississippi. We got corn out here. Right? So you can already see the foundation of railroad system in this, in this treaty right here where it says for patent railway mills. Mm. For grinding corn and will immediately purchase for them 24 cross cut saws. So, yeah, they out there, they getting ready to build, they getting ready to grind and put the work in and develop that Oklahoma territory. Y'all want to build on that? 
Right. I'm just again. saying it. Yeah. yeah. West, west of the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. They're building the civilization. Now they're building a home for mm-hmm. your Americans or what they were referred to them as Indians. So you see the game plan going on right now. Right. And it, it just mirrors what, what's taking place today. I mean, nothing is much different <laughs> at all. Thanks. All right. It being distinctly understood, however, that the grants thus made to the Creek Americans by this article are intended solely for the use and benefit of that portion of the Creek Nation who are now settled west of the Mississippi. And so everything that they're getting ready to build west of the Mississippi, it's specifically for the Creek Nation who's west of the Mississippi. It has nothing to do with that great body that did not go. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, like I said, the Creek Nation, that's who get the resources. Got you. Now, who okay. I put up under the Creek Nation, also those allotments going through the Creek, you know, however that goes, but yeah. Being very specific here. Yeah. Right. That portion of the Creek Nation who are now settled west. <clears throat> right. So if, you, so if you Creek and you east, or you Cherokee, you east, you Choctaw and you east, you Chickasaw and you east, you Cherokee and you east, you can't claim it. You're going to build it for them, and then the Creek Nation going to act like, yeah, we did it. Wow. Mm. <laughs> when in reality, it was the Cherokee and the Muscogee skill people that went out there and set up shop. See the game? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure people in Oklahoma right now, I'm sure the creek, I'm sure those creeks that are in Oklahoma right now, they probably are the what you want to call bougie of all the nations in Oklahoma. Yeah. They, they the practicing like, classism. Yeah. Not because they know what they did. Right. What, what, no. what they didn't do. What, what, right. What they didn't do. Right. They're they bringing their structure. Now it sounds like they're just bringing their structure from what they know in Europe over here. Now they're building this kind of like this class type of structure now. Creek Nation overseer, Cherokee, Seminole, working class. That, that's what I'm seeing right now. Okay. Okay. Which probably plays out to today. Like mm-hmm. I said, Creek Nation today, they're probably are that more recognized nation in Oklahoma. But, but truth be told, you were propped up. You really didn't right. have the skill set to really build nothing from the ground. You just got the European with the gun saying, okay, after y'all finish setting up shop, now the creek are going to act like they did it. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting. So we had Article 6. Mm-hmm. I'll read this, this little one. This is small. All right. The United States agree that the improvements the Creek Americans may be required to leave and consequence of the boundary lines this day settled between their people and the Cherokees shall be valued with as little delay as possible and a fair and reasonable price paid for the same by the United States. All right, so the improvements which the Creek Americans may be required to leave. So it sounds like they're referring to east of the Mississippi River because they're not leaving west of the Mississippi River. They're being sent west of the Mississippi. Mm, So it looks like like the nation and territory that they're leaving behind going west in consequence of the boundary lines this day settled between their people and Cherokee. So we can see Creek and Cherokee were bumping heads Mm -hmm. about about territory and, 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 and nation jurisdiction shall be valued with as little delay as possible. So now they want to appraise everything you leave and going west. They want to appraise everything you leave them behind and a fair and reasonable price paid for the same by the United States government. So here we can see the conflict. We got the military doing road contracts in the Creek Confederacy or the Southeast region of North America. And then we also got the United States government quote unquote purchasing that area that they're being forced out of by their mm. military. You with y'all with me? Wow. Right. right. So it's like they're just suppressing them even more, basically. Mm. It appears that they're giving them giving them things and um, you know, giving them a little bit more freedom or whatever, but they're really just suppressing them on both sides. 
really just creating another enemy within, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, now all the odds aren't at just the European. You know, we're distracted. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> all right, somebody want to rations. Up, somebody want to pick up that next article? I got it. It is hereby agreed by the Creek Nation parties here too that if the Saline or Salt Plains on the Great Western Prairies should come with the boundaries defined by the agreement as the country or as the country of the Creek Nation, then in that case the President of the United States shall have the power to permit all other friendly Indians or American tribes to visit said salt plains and and procure thereon and carry away salt sufficient for their substance without adherence and molestation from the said Creek Americans. Yeah, we're about to break that one down. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we can just go back to that first sentence. It is hereby agreed by the Creek Nations party here too that the Saline or Salt Plains on the Great Western Prairies should come with come within the boundaries defined by the by this agreement. Right. So right there. <clears throat> The European is saying, wherever we send you, Creek Nation, uh, if where we send you has saline or salt plains uh, on your land, then basically they're saying you got to let other nations or tribes come and get as much salt uh, or okay. saline that they need in order to survive. So again, so basically they're just infringing on the land that they just gave them. What I'm saying is no ownership. I'm seeing that these nations, there you cannot be a nation and 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 not be it, 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 you they lost their sovereignty. Mm. But, but sovereignty would, would really just uh what's what's the word I want to use in business? Um you're not self-sufficient. You're not, mm-hmm. debt, you're not you're not right. debt-free, right? Like if you run a debt-free operation, nobody can dictate to you. Right. So what you're seeing is the United States government is dictating to these nations like, oh, yeah, well, we move you at. By the way, if that product is on the area that we moving you, you got to let everybody who's in that area come get that. Well, how are you going to tell me what to do on my land? It ain't really your land. Right. Again, prisoner of war. your prisoner. Of war, you took the words right out my mouth. We're showing yeah. you. you can't do what you want to do without stuff okay. coming out. Right. right. <laughs> Going back to the agent, seeing which parts of the land produces what pieces, and now just infringing all of these laws and things, putting these nations in certain places where they probably don't even know what's in the land, but they do. So right. they say, look, if this is on the land, we come in, we get it as freely as we want to. It's crazy. And I wanna I wanna I wanna I wanna throw this in just for people to understand, especially with the European, you have to understand. And, and, and again, you got to stand on the edge of the coin, heads, tails, and stand on the edge and look at it with no emotion. Uh-huh. They don't have resources that the, world's need, that the world needs. The United right. Kingdom, right? Britain, they don't have resources that they're exporting out that the world needs. So when they came over here, you got to understand they're seeing stuff that they never saw before. But right. here's what separates the European from everybody else. He's a Lord God when it comes to paperwork. He documented everything that was mm-hmm. coming out of the land. Give him credit. Exactly. Give him credit. That's what he brought to humans on planet Earth. We weren't accounting for stuff like that. I mean, we counted when we did trade and we parlayed and we flipped. I mean, that's that's business. But their 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 accounting acumen. Is, mm. is 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 probably second to none uh, when you look at the human race. They account for everything. Everything, mm-hmm. literally. Everything. Mm-hmm. Y'all want to build on that? No, you hit it on there. I mean, yeah. the accounting is being seen what we're reading and just knowing today how, the, how well they are at it, everything they do as far as accounting, everything. We have years, 2022, because that's a count. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We're going to put you on a calendar and we're going to, yeah, everything, everything is in order. Time, every, yeah. Everything yeah. is in order. Now they live lies. Now they're, that's the asset they have. Now their liability is they live lies. What do you call a person? I don't know the medical term, but what do you call a person that cannot 
be honest? Is it schizophrenic? Pathological no, like, liar. It's, it's, a, it's a medical term. Like, like okay, yeah. let's. The, let's pathological take the idea. liar. Path, well, okay, pathological liar. So let's just take the reality oh, that. Habitual. Why do you call yourself American when you know your bloodline doesn't come to American soil? Right. How can you tell? How can you say that with a straight face? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you tell that lie, then it leads to the other lie. How can you sit up here and be born a man and go sit up here and, and say that I can identify with whatever I want to? Mm -hmm. You're out of line with nature. Mm -hmm. And then get upset when people that are that are in line with nature <laughs> kind of look at it like, hold on, what's going on? Oh, no, don't, don't. Right. You can't. Right, and that's yeah. part. That's part of the reset. The part of the reset is monetary. You have to get back to what ev what, what everybody on planet Earth knows is money, which is gold and silver. Right. Not only that, we have to talk about exchange rates. Most prisoners of war don't know exchange rates, but all these immigrants that come to North America, they know the exchange rate. They know what their fiat converts to against the dollar. We don't uh -huh. even talk that language amongst our people. And so we're, you wonder why we're losing. It's because we have a low financial IQ as a group of people. And the only way you can have a low financial IQ as a group of people, you're financially illiterate. You don't know financial terms. You don't know what an asset is. You don't know what a liability is. What do I mean by that? Prisoners of war will buy a liability called a BMW and they think they made it. Right. That's, yeah. not, a, that's not an asset. So we look at, we call liabilities assets. I'll stop right there. Uh, we just hit the 45 minute mark. Do y'all want to, anybody else want to build on how they're basically telling the creeks in this part of the article that yeah we're gonna move you in this area but uh these two resources we're noticing that everybody who lives in the western prairies they need this saline and these salts mm -hmm. so yeah we're gonna move you over here but you can't stop anybody from getting all the saline and salt they need right yeah it just sounds like they just destroy any type of commerce they already had going on you know, so now we're moving them all around. And now this is what's going to be happening on this land when it comes to resources. So anything they already had planned is out the window. They're not reaping no benefits. And like you said, just destroying everything they have and pretty much no ownership. You know, now they're now they are kind of like slaves to their own land because the guys right. are standing out in front. So let me throw this out. We only got two more articles. Y'all want to y'all want to go ahead and just we might as well just finish. Right. Yeah. OK. Payback of where we left off at. Okay. Right here. Okay. Oh. It, I got it. Okay. It is agreed by the parties to this convention that the country hereby provide for the Creek Indians or Creek Americans shall be taken in lieu uh -huh. or what's that word? In lieu of. In lieu of and considered to be a country provided or intended to be provided by the treaty made between the United States and the Creek Nation on the on the 24th day of January, 1826, under which they were moved to this country, under which they were moved to this country. Huh. All right. So basically, the United States is basically saying that the Creek Nation has agreed to go west of the Mississippi. And they agreed to that on the 24th day of January, 1896, right? So they did that seven years prior to this treaty, all right? So when they told them to go west of the Mississippi, the Creek started bumping heads with the Cherokee and the Muskegee and other people mm -hmm. out there. So that's why you see these before articles that we read tonight. That's why they're saying, okay, these other nations are kind of working out their kinks. And now you hear the United States government saying, okay, it's salt and, and, and saline in your area, Creek. You need to let all of these other nations get that. The Muscogee and the Cherokee, they agree to stop bumping heads. So like you said, it's a lot of infighting since, since you're putting all these nations all in one area on top of each other. Mm -hmm. so if I can bring it back to a prison system in today's society, it's almost like you take people from uh, Miami, you take people from Atlanta, you take people from New Orleans and you put them in one building, they're gonna have problems. 
because you got shot callers from each of them different cities and now you're putting them all in one little box or one building, right? And they got to hash all that out. And then at some point, they're going to get to fighting and killing each other. And then the warden got to come in and be like, okay, so here's how we're going. This is kind of how I'm seeing it. I mean, the prison system runs parallel with these treaties because that's just greater confinement. So for those, when I say the word prison, it's just greater confinement. You're, you're, no, you're not under delusion that you're occupied. You see what I'm saying? Because you're physically right. told what to do. Every they're, they're accounting for your movement every day. Right. In society that we live in now, they still account for our movement, but you do have a little bit of liberty. You have a little bit of liberty, but they account for everything you do. Try to organize as a group of prisoners of war and watch how the local city, county, state, and federal government offset whatever you're trying to do. Yeah, you're, you're, you're occupied. Let me stop right there. Y'all want to build on that? No, no you true. That's a good comparison in regards to, um, like you said, in the prison system, they're not under any type of illusion in regards to what's really going on. They know they are confined. They know that they are imprisoned. Um, we're living on what's supposed to be free land um we're supposed to have liberty but um unfortunately it's very slim <laughs> um so that's a great comparison correct no i agree i agree with both chief delegate and chief quiet what i just said okay i'll do this last article and keep in mind <clears throat> liberty is not freedom liberty right. is not freedom Right. To Liberty is like a pass. Right, mm-hmm. right. So, so you want a, a leash. <laughs> you want a leash. And you can look at society. If, if if somebody listens to this video and you get offended about prison, let's just use the word school. School, you have liberty. And they're restricting mm-hmm. those liberties. Some schools, you don't have the liberty to wear what you want to wear. Right. You don't have the liberty to walk however you want to get to that next class. Liberty. Or, right. Or you could be in the military. Right. You don't have the liberty to just do what you want. No, you got to get leave. Right. Somebody mm-hmm. has to give you the liberty to leave. Same thing with a prison system mm-hmm. right? or even in society. So it's levels or even if you are in a college dorm, let's go there. Even if you live on campus in the college, you still get commissary. Hmm, that word sounds familiar. You get commissary in the military. You get commissary in prison. So all of these different structures, you're being conditioned to have liberties. Yeah, if you know you got a class at a certain time, you got the liberty to go wherever you want, but you got to go to that college class. You live in a dorm. Soldiers live in barracks. Prisoners live in, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Sales. Sales, yeah, sales, barracks, dorms, same thing. Right, their system, their structure, same thing. Uh, So I'll do this last article, Chief Quietwater, if you could highlight it. And we have to overstand these systems. That's science and math. You have to overstand this structure that you're put into. Stop thinking that you're better than because you are in one particular system versus another. They're all constructed the same way. Uh, <clears throat> They're going to give you three exactly. hots. Mm, They're going to give you three hots in the cot, whether you're in right. prison, whether you're in military, or whether you're in college. I mean, come on now. Let's stop playing these games. Um, Breaking out of that box. <laughs> All right, this agreement shall be binding and obligatory upon the contracting parties as soon as the same shall be ratified and confirmed by the president and Senate of the United States. Done in open council at Fort Gibson this 14th day of February after death, 1,833. So we're at a fort, that's a military structure. Okay, so that means it sticks all around the Americans from all these different nations because you're at a fort. So you're surrounded by military. Now, let's just look at who signed this document at this fort on the 14th day of February, uh, where it says uh, signed, sealed and delivered in our presence. You got the Secretary of Commerce. We've never seen that signature on any treaty we've read thus far. You got the Colonel of the 7th Infantry. You got agents from the Creeks. You got agents from the Cherokee West. So you don't have any Creek representation east of the Mississippi. They got agents West. They pull, they pull agents from the Creek from West side. 
You got the U, you got a major from the US Army. You got a lieutenant from the 7th Infantry. You got an interpreter and you got a Cherokee interpreter. So basically all these American nations were surrounded by warlords and a secretary of commerce and a couple of interpreters and some agents. Yeah, what you gonna do? You gonna agree to every, every, every fucked up term on that treaty, what you gonna, how you gonna push back? <laughs> on it, look at it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Don't how many, call him. Go ahead. How many people would be in the infantry? Because you got the colonel and lieutenant of the seventh infantry. So how many people would embody an infantry? Because that's what's at that fort. So how can you not agree to these terms? And they got exactly. you at Fort Gibson. They got right. you at <laughs> their largest massive organization. The, the, so if it came to the Europeans during this time, the biggest organization is the military. So yeah, they ain't had no choice but to pretty much sign these dotted lines. How many people would that be? Uh, infantry, like how, just try to give the world a number. Like when you got the I mean, colonel and fort, for, for, like a fort or like a battalion or a company. Yeah. Just based on what they're saying right here. So a, a fort, 50,000. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we can see here at the end of this treaty that Treaty Fort Gibson clearly shows that the United States government would end the contract with the Crete Nation, Cherokee Nation, Muscogee, and Seminole Nation. We've mm -hmm. seen the United States government contract prior to this treaty. It was the military contracting separate and apart from, from the United States government. So that, that would be my closing statement on this treaty. This, this is the only treaty out of the Seminole Wars that the United States government contracted with the nations. Uh, and so, yeah, with, and you can see the terms and conditions and you can just kind of put yourself, based on who signed this treaty, put yourself in that situation. If them people are around you, you got the infantry around you, like how can you push back on, on, on terms? What's y'all right. statements on that? Yeah, I mean, they signed these documents on Fort Gibson, so they're already inside of their quarters. So now you know exactly. just, you know, right now we're just going over terms and conditions, and this is already an agreement beforehand. Now we're just going over and writing. Now it's solid. So it's unfortunate, you know, these agents west of the uh, Mississippi are these Cherokees. You know, again, we I think we talked about it previous in these uh treaties they're probably just pull a random you know non-chief Cherokee right. men or women and now they're sitting in these meetings going over these terms and conditions like and they're basically playing both sides of the fence so yeah all right we'll shut it down and get into the readings and uh another good class yeah good being it Who's doing the uh, 12 steps? I got you. Did you want me to pull them up on the screen? Uh, if you want to, so the viewers can read it, but I got it in front of me as well. Oh, okay, okay. So 13 week practical program of action for each American descendant of slavery. Number one, learn about an estate or a state your family originated from. Number two, who established that estate. Number three, what nation or confederacy had jurisdiction over that area prior to the European. Number four, ask about all nonprofit organizations you attend, which are, what's your position on your <clears throat> Apologize. Ask all nonprofit organizations you attend what's your position on reparations. Number five, they either support it or they don't. No support, no money. However, they support it. They immediately, children and adults, need weekly classes free of charge about steps one, two, and three, and field trips to ADOS landmarks in that city, county, and state. Number six, don't support European holidays for the remainder of the 13 week time frame. Number seven, avoid spending money with any small businesses that does not hire your people, i.e. gas stations, nail salons, subways, etc. Number eight, all businesses need operating cash, spend money with American business, black businesses. Number nine, all other groups rely on your energy, 
our energy and operating cash to survive, set trends of making other groups follow our lead and support our clubs, services, products, and entertainment. Number 10, the U.S. government is bankrupt. The Federal Reserve prints money, i.e. quantitative easing. It also burns money, i.e. quantitative teething. The United States dollar hasn't been backed by gold since Richard Nixon in 1971, the Gold Standard Act. The government operates off full faith of its citizens to pay debts and taxes. American descendants of slavery no longer have faith in the United States government. This is why financial support will be altered, stopped, and redirected. Number 11, teach your kids one hour a day about their history on this land. Have them learn about a black inventor. Have them know about our heroes. They should know the European that conquered the state you live in. They should know the nation of people prior to the European invasion militarily and culturally. Number 12, practicing these steps will educate us on the land where we are claiming America and attaches us to the history and laws of the U.S. government. Each estate American descendants of slavery live in, live in should have steps one, two, and three advertised via social media, radio, and newspaper. This in 13 week one physical quarter will bring us together for our common cause. Okay. Uh, you want to do the um, inventor, Chief Quietwater? Yes. Actually. And you go ahead and do yours and then I'll pull up my information. Let me see. Okay. I'll do today the uh, I will do the third quote uh, from Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, it says it is well understood that if by the teaching of you let me start over. Third quote, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Black History Month. It was well understood that if by the teaching of history, the European man could be further assured of his superiority and the Negro could be made to feel that he has always been a failure and that the, sub and that the subjection of his will to some other race is necessary. The freedman then would still be a slave. If you can control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. When you determine what a man shall think, you don't have to concern yourself about what he will do. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, founder of Black History Month, and that is our third quote off of our 13. Okay. So this week for the inventor is Thomas Henry Edmonds. Um, there wasn't a lot of information on him. He lived in Washington, um, D.C. His patent, basically he invented the separating screen. And the separating screen um, was to be used in any type of water supply pipe where it was desirable to keep lint, scale, shale, or any foreign substance um, from passing, passing through pipes. The patent date is July 20th, 1897. And the patent number is 586-5724. Okay. And again, his name is Thomas Henry Edmonds. And what percentage of income do we receive from uh, giving that uh, invention to the world? Nothing at all. And just a side note on that, when you're talking about that screen, right? And you think about the old Western movies, how the European would be in the water and they're searching for gold and they're letting the ah. gold shake. Yeah. And then you can even think about your water filter today or the water right. filter on any of your home machines that run your house. There's always a screen on the inside of that water valve to stop the uh, the large foreign debris. So yeah, that, that started from, again, that's another industry that, that, that we've given to the world that why don't we own what we, how is it that we have all these industries that we created and we don't own any of them? Any of it. Come on, y'all. Y'all make it make sense. You can't we are, right. We are that elite class. All that shit just got stolen. <laughs> Pushed around. Yeah. Fought many, many years. And now we completely, it's foreign to us to believe that we own all these industries. Exactly. Right. So when we talk about reparations, this isn't hard, y'all. Like, we're literally showing the world. And, you know, kudos to everybody that's uh, a part of this movement because we're showing you what a goal looks like, how you work out a goal in real life. 
And I'm gonna tell you prisoners of war the secret. You know why we can't get our shit back right now? You know why we don't have an agenda? You know why we don't have goals set? Cause it's boring. That's the key, it's boring. Coming up is boring. Going broke is fun. Coming up is boring. Nobody wants to do the work week after week after week after week. And then you pop out 13 weeks later and everybody can see your growth. Like, man, where you been at? What you been doing? I've been right. working. We don't want to stick to nothing. So why are you supporting this system when it's took everything from you? It's took all your inventions, all the industries that are on the stock market, all these exports and imports that are coming in and out of this country. You created it. Exactly. Get it back. You ain't you ain't got to recreate nothing. You've already your ancestors already created it. But that Dr. Carter G. Woodson quote that I read, you fucked around and let the Europeans school you into who you are. And they miseducated you because the truth is you own it. You created it. Y'all want to throw something in before we close? No, you had a good build up, man. It ain't hard. Yeah. Starts with the mind, you know. Starts with the mom. I'll go ahead and do the legal definitions and the maroon historical points. Um, American, a native of America, descendants, one who follows in the bloodline of an ancestor, either linearly or collaterally. Slavery, a situation in which one person has absolute power over the life, fortune, and liberty of another. <laughs> Prisoner of war, a person, usually a soldier who is captured by or surrenders to the enemy in wartime. School, an institution at which instruction is given in a particular discipline, education, and enlightening experience. And the maroon points, number one, was a person escaping slavery, seeking freedom or breaking the law. Number two, providing unity and a strong defense came first. Number three, Maroon leaders were first and foremost military figures. Number four, ma maroon, Maroons established guerrilla warfare, planting sharp sticks in thick grass. Number five, Maroons knew the European enemy's language, defenses, and plans. All right, that, this was a good meeting. So we finished the last treaty. We'll continue our bill. And we'll continue to show the world that we are organized, we can be disciplined, and we can set a goal and accomplish it. So today is October 31st. This is another European holiday within the last fiscal quarter of the year that we don't give a damn about. If you're out there and you're celebrating this particular holiday, you don't even realize that you're awakening another group of people's demons. Today is a demon day that Europeans honor their, their martyrs. So if you're out there and you're participating in this, understand it's almost like you're putting a curse on yourself. Why is it so hard to create your own holidays? We've already listed over 20 inventors. Pick an inventor. We can have a holiday every month if we want to, every week, and honor our own ancestors. Anything y'all want to say? Oh, can you stand up a little bit, Chief Black Coat? I know, you know... Okay, so we can see right there on his shirt, he's representing the Braves. Uh, that is an American term, not a European term. So when you out there and you hear people talking about that tomahawk chop, that's really the Seminole War cry during the Seminole Wars. So shout out to uh, the American Braves, again, that have been uh, reclassified. What y'all want to say in closing before we get up out of here? It's a good, a good, um, good class. Yep. Now, see you guys next week. Yes, ma'am. Go 